On this episode, I welcome Dr. Liz Tyson of Born Free USA. She's gonna be taking us on the tour of the largest monkey sanctuary in the US. She lives and works here and is gonna be teaching us why monkeys and other wild animals should never be kept as pets. Hey Liz, I am so great to be talking to you today. And to start off, let's talk about you. Okay. Can you introduce yourself, tell us what you do, where you're from, and where you're currently located? I'm lucky enough to be able to get to do my job and live here in South Texas in, as you said, the largest monkey sanctuary in the United States. I'm originally from the United Kingdom, from England. Um, I've worked in this field for 17 years, which is a very long time. And I've lived and worked here for just under three years now. How old were you when you first got into conservation? I was probably about 11, but I probably didn't recognize what I was doing at the time as conservation. So two things happened when I was 11. One was I chose to go vegetarian. Um, because I really liked animals and I didn't want to eat them. And also at that time, I volunteered at my local wildlife hospital, looking after hedgehogs and squirrels and badgers and pigeons and all sorts of animals who'd been rescued because they'd been harmed in some way by, by people, whether that is their, their home was destroyed or they were hit by a car or something happened to them. It was important work to help me understand how we relate to our world. I moved from London from an office job which had nothing to do with animals and went to live by the sea, pick up monkey poop during the day and work on education projects surrounding the conservation of monkeys in their habitat and also projects to campaign against the primate pet trade which I'm still involved in now many many years later so that was the first thing I ever did and that's where honestly that's when I fell in love with monkeys and that was the beginning of my career which honestly at that time I had no idea that it was going to be 17 years later I was still doing it and I absolutely love it it changed the course of my life and I've been very very lucky to have some of the experiences that I've had that sounds like an amazing first job <laughs> okay can you tell us about the mission of Born Free USA? Absolutely. So Born Free USA is an animal welfare and conservation organization. We work partly in the US. We also work in West Africa and Canada. And the global Born Free family works all over the world. We are interested in species conservation, but we're also interested in how the individual animals play a part in that species conservation. So we care a lot about individual animals um, as well as making sure that species can thrive in their natural environments. Can you share how this monkey sanctuary started in South Texas? This sanctuary has kind of a strange history. So back in the 1970s, there was a troop of monkeys in Japan where um, Japanese macaques are from, hence the name. People were feeding them, they were kind of being provisioned by the local community. They got too big and ended up in this kind of human wildlife conflict situation with the local communities. Then the authorities were gonna kill those monkeys. So someone here in Texas who had access to a ranch decided that they were gonna rescue them and they brought them over here. This place didn't start off really as a sanctuary, it was more as a center where people could observe the behavior of the monkeys and learn about them. We took over in 2008, and from then we've really worked to develop it into kind of a legitimate sanctuary. We have GFAS accreditation, which is the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, which means we pass some rigorous testing to make sure we're providing the best life possible. And now we rescue monkeys from the pet trade, from zoos, and from animal experimentation. That's amazing. <laughs> okay, how many monkeys live here and where did they come from? A lot of monkeys live here. We've got 434 monkeys who live here right now. We're in our big enclosure, which is 56 acres. We've got 130 monkeys in here at the moment. Wow. We don't necessarily see all 130 monkeys every day. We come in here every day multiple times to feed and give medication to anyone who might need it. But camera traps allow us to see the monkeys that we're not seeing in person sometimes. So we will often put the camera traps near a watering place because we know every monkey will eventually <laughs> visit there. And then we can get footage of them to make sure everyone's okay. Or if somebody's looking sick, 
we know who we're looking for and then we can come in and try and find them. So it's a really useful tool for us when we're working in big spaces. On hot days, you will often find them by the pond, but otherwise they kind of hang out wherever they want to. And it's not necessarily a specific place, it's more to do with who they hang out with and they use the space pretty well. What are all the different types of monkeys you have? The monkeys in here are Japanese macaques. We also have long-tail macaques, stump-tail macaques, rhesus macaques, and then we have olive baboons. We have a couple of hamadryas baboons. We have one guinea baboon called Betsy. <laughs> How do you pick the monkeys' different names? <laughs> Um, goodness, when you've got 430, you pretty much go through all the names in the world. <laughs> so we've had monkeys who've been named after members of staff. We have monkeys named after foods. We have Stoop and Waffle. One of our most recent arrivals, Audrey, was named after Audrey Hepburn. Oh. Not that we actually thought Audrey looks like Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> We just thought she was very pretty. Wow. It can be anything, honestly. As a true sanctuary, we don't breed the monkeys, but there were generations before we took over. So some are descendants. Other monkeys have come to us from animal experimentation. So they've had a really traumatic past where they've been kept in laboratories, often never having seen another monkey before, often never having set foot outside, seen the sun, seen grass, felt the wind on their face. And then some of them come from zoos. So sometimes roadside zoos that have been shut down because the standards are so terrible, or even larger zoos that decide that they don't want these animals anymore and we provide a home for life for them. Yeah, it's amazing how many monkeys you're saving here. It's so <laughs> inspiring. You. Are the monkeys sick when they arrive and have they been harmed? Some of them, yes. Some of them come to us sick both physically and also sometimes mentally and emotionally because monkeys are supposed to live in great big troops in their natural habitat. They're supposed to be with their friends and their family and live like monkeys. If you've ever been to a zoo and seen an animal pacing backwards and forwards or seeing a bear rocking on his back legs, those are signs of stereotypic behaviors which just mean that they're very stressed. So we try to work with them to give them a better life and thankfully we usually see those behaviors diminish as time goes on and they get a chance to just be monkeys. Yes, it's very important. It is. How did their life change after coming to this sanctuary? For most of them, thankfully, we're able to find them uh, a best friend and they can groom one another and they can play with one another. We try to provide the best future we can for them, but honestly, some of them come to us so traumatized that they don't get better. We had a monkey called Charlie who came to us a couple of years ago. He was only seven. He'd been kept as a pet. His story was very typical. He'd, he'd bitten the grandson of his owner. The grandson, thankfully, was okay, but he had to go to hospital and he had to have surgery on his hand, as I understand. And Charlie was then threatened with being killed by the authorities because they considered him dangerous. But thankfully, he ended up coming here. So, and we tried so hard to find him a friend that he could live with, but he was so traumatized from his past that he was terrified of other monkeys and he was constantly pressed. And eventually we found him in his enclosure one morning and he passed away. You're gonna be meeting some of, the, some of the monkeys who are such success stories and have such a wonderful life here. But I think it's really important that we don't pretend that sanctuaries can fix everyone. The only thing that can fix this situation is by making sure they're never pets in the first place because we can't save all of them. We have a waiting list of monkeys who we would love to be able to provide a home for, but until we build new enclosures and we need to get funding for that, then at the moment we're not able to take any. We provide the best care we possibly can to all of the monkeys we possibly can, but we just can't take all of them. We do hope to build some new enclosures in the coming year and then we can start rescuing again, which is really exciting. Um, but yeah, we've got to keep working to change the laws, to change the way people think about things and um, to help stop the trade. Yeah. I think when we think about the illegal pet trade, we kind of think about people smuggling lizards or pangolins or, or monkeys in suitcases and bringing them through airports and, you know, crossing international borders. But actually, the illegal pet trade is also right here in the United States. In many states, it's perfectly legal, for example, to keep a monkey as a pet. And I think what's really important is to remember that just because something is legal, it doesn't mean it's right. 
Until we are able to make the trade completely illegal here in the US, that can also mask the illegal trade because it's difficult to tell if it's legal to keep a monkey as a pet in the US, how do you know that your neighbor's monkey has been purchased or found legally? So they could have been trafficked and they could have been brought from their home country. And that was something that we used to see a lot of when I worked for a sanctuary in the United Kingdom. We had a number of monkeys who were brought illegally into the country. They'd been captured in the wild. And if you imagine what that means for them, it means often their mother is shot from a tree or from wherever they live. The baby who's totally vulnerable will then cling to the person who's killed their mother. And then the baby will be sold at a market and then traded on. And I think until countries like the US, countries like the United Kingdom, where I'm from, until we ban this trade, we are always going to be encouraging and facilitating the illegal trade elsewhere. Yes, I agree. That's it's so sad. Mm -hmm. Can you explain how some states do allow people to have exotic animals as pets and why this complicates everything? I think a lot of people very innocently think that, you know, if it's legal, it must be okay. Some animal welfare expert somewhere must have agreed to this law and, you know, been involved, you know, so therefore it must be all right. And these animals can't be suffering if it's legal, right? But that isn't the case. These animals really do suffer when they're kept as pets, and that really doesn't matter if they're kept illegally or legally. If it's illegal, you know that if there is a monkey in that state and you know that it's illegal to keep them as a pet, we can go straight in and we have a solution. It really complicates things when there is this kind of legal trade where people think it's okay, and really it isn't. We have Maud and Oliver who live in here. This is Brooke and Eddie. Aww. They were used in laboratories. And this is Audrey, so this is who I was just talking about, who's really pretty. Um, now look at Mrs. Wilkin when she moves, she's just all bent out of shape. Aww. All of her long bones in her body are curved and deformed. But do you know what? She kind of has a pretty great life. She's feisty <laughs> and she gets what she wants. And out of the two of them, she is definitely the dominant one. But we, we love her. We love her so much. She's such an amazing monkey. This is Darwin, and he's really interested in people. And he was, believe it or not, kept as a pet. Wow. Do you like Kate? Yeah. Aww. She's one of us, buddy. Everyone in here used to live in the big enclosure, but they're in here now because they need closer care. So this is like our little retirement village for some of the older monkeys. So now let's talk about action. This is my yes. last question, <laughs> very important. What can kids and teens do about the pet trade industry? How can we be advocates on behalf of monkeys and other animals that should be free? That's an amazing question. I think there's so many things that people can do, and particularly young people. I think, you know, you guys have all grown up with, with social media and the internet. So a lot of, you know, big Instagram accounts or big Facebook accounts have, you know, baby monkeys and diapers or, you know, baby big cats on leashes. And a lot of people go and they like it and they think it's great and they think it's funny and they think it's cute. Um, and it really isn't, it's really damaging. So speaking out about things like that is really important. So learning as much as you can about the, the, the subjects that you're interested in and then just sharing that information is really powerful. Education is such a powerful thing. And I think finally, even though you might not be old enough to vote or play an active part in kind of the democratic system, there's always really important laws that are in the process of being passed. For example, we're working on some legislation at the minute which would look to ban the import of some monkeys for animal experimentation. We're also working on something called the Big Cat Public Safety Act, which would ban the keeping of big cats privately and banning the kind of interaction with them in public places like roadside zoos. Young people contacting your representatives and saying, hey, this is an issue that I'm really interested in. That could be really valuable. I think other things you can do is find organizations you really like their work that they're doing and ask them, contact them and say, hey, what can I do to help? You don't have to know a lot about the subject. So say you're a great runner or you really like swimming or something like that, you could do a sponsored event. Say you like baking, you could do a bake sale and use that and use that money to donate so that those organizations can continue their good work. I think there's so much that everyone can do. Okay, so to this point, where can our viewers go to learn more about the amazing work you're doing here at Born Free USA? You can go to our website, which is bornfreeusa.org. You can find us on all the socials, we're on Instagram, we're on 
on Facebook, we're on Twitter, um, search Born Free USA and we will come up. And from there, you can find out specific information about our sanctuary and you can follow our wider work to change laws and advocate on behalf of animals around the world. Amazing. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. It was amazing learning about everything you're doing and about every, all the work you're doing with the monkeys. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. That was great. That was so much fun speaking to you. Hi. What you doing? Hi. Let me see. Yes. <laughs> One way we can all be animal advocates is going to bornfreeusa.org and foster your own monkey. Let's go!